starting a new series of sermons today dealing with bringing our lives to God's plumb line. If you know what a plumb line is, it's used to make sure things are straight. And God's Word gives us a lot to say about how to make sure our lives are straight. But one of those ways is to buy thinking is to be thinking about what we were before God saved us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Would you stand with me, please, as I read aloud from God's Word? And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Our Father, our God, we thank you for this reminder of what we were before we were saved. Lord, it's painful, it's shameful, it's unpleasant, uncomfortable to look back and think back to what we were before you saved us. But it matters that we be reminded of that so that we would always see why we serve you because you've done so much for us. You brought us from death to life, from light, from darkness rather to light, You've done this for us. You've forgiven us. You've given us every reason to live for you. Would you help us do that today as we worship you through the preaching and the listening to your word? And we pray all this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Today in this message, I want to remind you, if you are a child of God, of what you were before the Lord Jesus Christ saved you. We all need to be reminded of things, don't we? Have you noticed this? It's certainly true for me. The older I get, the more I find that my memory is not what it used to be. My memory decreases and my forgetfulness increases. Am I the only one who has that problem? I, I have that problem, folks. I think most of us battle with forgetfulness in, in one way or another. Here are some statistics on forgetfulness. According to one researcher, 42% of people forget faces, 49% forget what was said, 57% forget telephone numbers, 60% of us forget where something is, and 83% of us forget names, and if you can't remember whether you've just done something, then you're like 38% of the population, folks. When I came to St. Clair Southern Baptist Church over 20 years ago, I was 39 years old. I didn't forget things like I do now. I didn't have to write notes to myself and jot things down. I can remember names and phone numbers, things like that, without using pencil or paper. But I have found in these 20 plus years that I've been with you that a short pencil is better than a long memory. You know what I'm saying? It helps me to write stuff down. I've even found myself in recent years calling someone on the phone <coughs> and as they pick up the phone saying, who is this that I just called? Ever happened to you? When I make a bunch of phone calls, that seems to happen to me. Some of you probably had this experience with me. I've probably dialed your number and you said hello. And the first thing I said was, who is this? And you're wondering, who is this? Now we laugh at that because we've done the same thing. But folks, it becomes easy to do this. Over the years, I've been able to overcome some of my forgetfulness by giving myself a stern warning, by telling myself, look, this is really important. Don't forget this. Whatever you do, don't forget this. You must not forget this. And I say, now this is one thing that you simply must not forget. You must remember this no matter what. And that usually works, but I also tell Brenda to not let me forget things that I must remember. But sometimes she forgets them too, and they were both in trouble, so you see how that works. But this morning I want to say to you here from Ephesians chapter 2, what I say to myself about the importance of remembering certain things. Chapter 2 of Ephesians talks to us about some things that we must remember. I want to say to you, if you are my brother and sister in Christ today, that there are some things you simply must not forget. You must not forget these things. You must not. I want to tell you today 
about one of the most important things that Christians must not forget, and we need this because we have this terrible tendency to forget things, this, this problem of letting things just drift right out of our mind. Some very important things, some very meaningful things. We see this very easily in the New Testament where the writers write to remind the readers of certain things. Simon Peter wrote about this in the first, in the, in the two, letter, two letters he wrote, first and second Peter. We see this kind of thing every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. You see these words here on the table. It says, this do in remembrance of me. We do this on purpose. It's to remember on purpose what Jesus did for us. A reminder of how he died for our sins. We have this tendency to forget. The Lord's Supper reminds us of what Jesus did. Now, you might say we surely don't need to be reminded of Jesus dying for our sins, do we? But we do because we get so distracted by other things that we do forget these things. And the first thing we know, we're not living as we should. We're not as close to God as we should be. We're not letting the light of the cross shine out of our lives. It's not, on, it's not guiding our pathway or guiding our steps. So the Bible constantly hammers on this theme of how Christians forget and how they need to be reminded of things. So I want to suggest to you today that there is one thing that we must not forget, and that is what we were before God saved us. The Apostle Paul talks about it here in these first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. As Christians, you and I must not forget what we were before we were saved. Now, I was talking to the deacons about this before we came into the sanctuary this morning, and they said, oh, Brother Bill, I'd rather not go back there. That's, a, uh, that's an unpleasant picture. That's an ugly picture. That's an uncomfortable picture. But folks, here's what I'm wanting to say about remembering these things. One of these supremely important things that, that's going to have a tremendous effect on us living for God, how we live every single day of our life is to remember what we were before God saved us. It will have a greatly beneficial effect on how you live the Christian life day by day if you remember what you were before God saved you. Time and history are divided into two major parts. You know this. We call them B.C., before Christ and A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Well, today, I will tell you that the life of the Christian is divided into two major parts as well. And we call those parts B.C., before conversion, and A.C., after conversion. The apostles did this, so I'm in good company today by doing this, by reminding us today of what that B.C. is like, what that before conversion period of our lives was like before God saved us. Occasionally, somebody who commits a terrible sin will say, well, I'd like to forget what I've done. I just wish people would let me forget it and just let it go and not bring it back anymore. But I read these letters of Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul and these other letters of the New Testament, and I see that these men were just like that. They kept reminding people, reminding people. They just simply would not let it be forgotten what they were, what God did for them. They kept bringing it up. The Apostle Paul certainly did this. He reminded others of their past. And by doing so, he was doing for them what he often did for himself. He reminded the Corinthians of what they were in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That'd be a great place to go read this afternoon, verses 9 through 11. He said, some of you were killers and murderers and homosexuals and liars and cheaters and coveters. Some of you were that, he says. He does the same thing with the Colossians in chapters 1 and 3. He does the same thing with the Thessalonians in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul was always reminding himself of his pre-conversion days, his B.C. condition, before conversion. He was always doing that. It seems like those days were never far from his mind. He talks about himself as being the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He often referred to himself as a blasphemer, that he was a persecutor in Acts chapter 26. He says that. Well, the question is, why did Paul remind his readers and himself of their condition and his condition before conversion? Why would he do that? Why bring up the past? Why dredge it up? Some people are always saying, well, just forget the past. You can't change it. You can't go back and do anything different. So just leave it be. Just let it go. Paul would have agreed with that view on some things, but not on this thing. Not here in chapter 2 of Ephesians. He would not agree on this thing. 
Paul says, we need to remember these things. We need to remember the past about this thing. And the reason Paul was constantly reminding people of what they were before they were saved and what he was before he was saved is he knew that the reminder of their past would influence their present. If they would remember what God did for them, for what they were like in the past, it would affect their present. He knew that if people would remember what they were before they were saved, they would be stimulated, stirred up, and energized for living for Christ in the present. Now, folks, Christians definitely need to be stirred up today. Do you agree with that? They need to be stirred up. We need to be motivated, stimulated, and energized. We need this so desperately today. We really do. Here's just a small indication of where the church in general is today. Many of us are just moping along, dragging along in spiritual things. Many Christians dabble in sin, and I'll, I'll go further than that. Really, they don't just dabble in it, they plunge headlong into it. Many of us are sleepwalking through our worship services. They're, they're more glazed over than a donut, you know what I'm saying? They really are. They just go on just drifting along here. That's many Baptists today, I'm sorry to say. There are many Baptists today who will use trivial things to excuse themselves from ever doing anything for God. Where the slightest little thing is enough to keep them out of the house of God and to keep them from serving God. You let them sneeze, some Baptist that is, and they'll go to bed on Sunday and say, well, I must be coming down with something. And especially these days, well, are you positive for this or that virus? Folks, it doesn't even seem to matter much today. It, it doesn't take much today, it seems like, for some people. There's little compassion, little concern for family members and friends who are marching off into eternity. They have no thought about that whatsoever. We fail to mourn over the sins of our own country, our own day, our own wickedness. Truth is, we even find ourselves making little jokes about our wickedness of our day. This is not only Christianity in general today, by the way. Unfortunately, this is true right here in our own little slice of Christianity here at St. Clair Southern Baptist Church. So this morning, I'm proposing to try upon you and upon myself to remind you, remind myself, a little bit of this apostolic treatment that Paul is talking about here, that I, we're, we're going to be reminded of what we were before we were saved in the hopes that it will stir you and spur you to lay aside all the moping and the dragging along and lay aside all these trivial excuses and lay, and lay aside all this lack of interest in worship and on and on we could go. So I want to stir us and spur us today to repentance and to renewed commitment to Christ. I want to divide the sermon into two parts here today. Here's the first part. I want to make an assertion, a declaration, a statement of fact to you. And then after I state that fact and make that assertion, I want to ask a couple questions and try to answer those questions. Well, here's the assertion. Number one, first part of the message. Here it is. The greater the things you believe the Lord has done for you, the more you will feel like serving the Lord. Let me say that again. The greater the things that you believe the Lord has done for you, the more you will feel like serving the Lord. If you believe God has really done something for you, and if you're saved, you know He's really done something for you, don't you? You know that. God has really done something for you if He saved you. And the more you know that, the more you see that, the more you will feel like serving Him. If you believe that the Lord has done very little for you, you're not going to feel like doing much for Him. You really won't. But if you believe the Lord has done much for you, much, you're going to feel like doing much for the Lord. So tell me, how do you think about your B.C. state? When you look back, how do you look at that condition you were in before God saved you? That's what I'm talking about this morning. You tell me how you see that, and I will tell you how much you feel like serving the Lord. If you think, well, that your B.C. state, your before-conversion state 
was just mildly serious. It wasn't that big a deal. I wasn't that bad a person. Then you will think salvation is only mildly wonderful. But if you think that your before conversion state was dreadfully serious, that before God stepped in, you were headed for hell. If you think things like that, you will think salvation is gloriously wonderful. Now, won't you? Because you understand what God did. He saved you. If you are professing faith in Christ here today, and yes, there's another issue here along this line, that I don't really have time to deal with here in the message this morning, and that is the possibility of being deceived, of of thinking you're saved when you're really not. But I've got to restrict myself this morning here to those who are truly saved here today. So I'll ask you again. Tell me what you think about your pre-conversion state. What were you like before Jesus came in and changed you? Now, for some of us, we're going to say, well, that was way back when I was young. When I was a kid, that was true for me. I hadn't robbed any banks. I didn't shoot anybody. My face wasn't on the wanted posters at the post office. But folks, that's not the point we're after here this morning. If you believe the Lord Jesus Christ has done great things for you, you will feel like doing great things for Him, will you not? Let me try that one more time. If you feel the Lord Jesus Christ has done great things for you, you will feel like doing great things for Him, right? That's how that goes. What I'm saying to you is this, little sin leads to little salvation, and little salvation leads to little service. Little sin leads to little salvation, and little salvation leads to little service. Do you remember that story from Luke? Hold your place there in Ephesians 2. Go back with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 7, if you would, please. Luke chapter 7. There's a story here that's told to us where Jesus has gone to a meal at the home of a man named Simon, who's a Pharisee. And in Luke chapter 7, starting down there in verse 36, he's in this Pharisee's house when suddenly a woman, verse 37, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, folks, big difference here in how Simon reacts and how this woman reacts. Jesus is having supper with Simon the Pharisee in Simon's house. This woman walks in off the street. She's weeping. She walks right in. Houses in those days were different from how, from ours. They were much more open than ours are. She walks right in. She's standing there weeping. She's at his feet. She anoints the feet of Jesus. She wipes his feet with her hair. Now that's what we see here. Verse 38 says it. She wiped, she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil, washed his feet with her tears. Okay. Wiped his feet with her hair. Simon the Pharisee is shocked by all this. He's shocked by her behavior. And look at what Jesus says to him. Verse 40, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with it to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Now, those are key words in verse 43. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Look at that. Simon is shocked. Jesus says those who have been forgiven much, love much. 
But those who have been forgiven little love so little. Simon's whole problem was he didn't love the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason he didn't love the Lord Jesus Christ was because he was filled with his own righteousness. That's what the Pharisees were known for. Simon would have been quick to tell you, hey, 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 now, hey, everybody calm down. I'm okay. I'm all right. Pharisees were so proud of themselves. They thought they were okay as they were. They were not conscious of their own sin. And the Bible's filled with verses that says, be careful, be very careful to not be blind to your own sin. If the the Pharisees were, were to ever give a diagnosis of themselves, they would have not have talked about sin. Oh, not at all, not at all. They would have talked about their righteousness. Look how good I am. Look at, look at all the stuff I do. In Luke chapter 18, there's another story Jesus tells. Turn over there with me for just a moment. Luke 18. Jesus tells a parable, a story, about praying. He talks about two men. Down there in verse 9. And he also spoke this parable to some who trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Here's the Pharisees again. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. And listen to this, folks. He starts bragging, I fast twice a week. Oh, yeah, I do. I give tithes of all that I possess. Look at me. Look what I do. Look at me. Jesus says that man did not go down to his house justified. He says the other man is a tax collector. Verse 13. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you want to know what the sinner's prayer is, that's it right there. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Two men, very different. They don't leave that place the same. This was typical Pharisees filled with their own righteousness. Simon did not love Jesus because as far as Simon was concerned, he had no sin. Since he had no sin, he had no need of a Savior. You know people like that, don't you? I've got family like that. Well, I don't need to be saved. Saved from what, they tell me? I'm a pretty good person. Simon thought that about himself. But this woman, oh, she was different than Simon. Very, very different. This woman loved Jesus Christ passionately. Passionately. And the reason she loved Jesus Christ so passionately was because she was so conscious of the fact that she was a great sinner. She had lots of sins. And she was so conscious of her sins that the Lord Jesus Christ was a great Savior who had forgiven her of her sin. He says to her, I forgive you of your sins. Now we say, well, we're not as bad as she is. She had great sin, so she loved with a great love. Let me stop and ask you at this point. Whose company are you in today? Are you with Simon the Pharisee who says, well, you know, yeah, yeah, okay. I I guess the Lord Jesus did a little bit for me, but I was a pretty good person as is. If that's your understanding of salvation and you've made a profession of faith, I will say you've made a false profession of faith. If you think your sin is a little thing, not a big thing, you've missed the point. Someone has actually said, you know, I really didn't need much saving. I was pretty good as I was. Oh, really? That's not how God says it. That's not what He says. I'm so afraid this is where so many people are today. In our Baptist churches, week after week, you know, I'm pretty good as is. I'm better than most people. They don't have a passionate love for Christ because they think, I don't need much saving. I'm okay as I am. I'm a pretty good person. You're in the Simon the Pharisee's company if you say that stuff. But if you understand, as this woman did, the very depth of your sin, you will appreciate the Savior and you will want to serve the Savior, no doubt about it. You'll appreciate Him, want to serve Him. Do you know why most people 
I'm not serving Christ today. You want to know why most Baptists have such a struggle serving Christ today? Now, you might want to write this down. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. I've thought about this for a long time, for years and years, and I've discovered the reason that most Baptists today have difficulty serving Christ. Are you ready? Here it is. They don't want to. That's why. They don't want to. That's it. I've watched this thing. I've studied this thing over the years. The reason most Baptists today and most people today don't serve as Christ is because they don't want to. The question is, why don't they want to? I think we're face to face with the answer here in Ephesians 2. It's because they are not aware of what a great thing salvation is. If, let's stop and ask ourselves. If most people who call themselves Christians were asked this question, how big, how important, how great is salvation? What do you think they would say? Uh, okay. A long time ago, far, far away, I got over it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're truly saved, you never get over that. You never get over that. Once you become aware of what a great thing salvation is, you get your want to fixed. Isn't that true? Well, that's the assertion, the statement. Now I want to wrap this up with a couple of questions. The first question is, how do we determine what our pre-conversion state is or was, our before conversion state? How do we determine what it was? Well, we ought to be careful here because some of us have this terrible tendency to always depend on a couple of wrong points of reference when it comes to knowing just what were we like before God saved us. Some people say, well, yeah, I know I needed saving, but I wasn't as bad as other people. I can show you people right here in my town who are worse than me. Yes, I need the Lord to save me, but it wasn't as bad as a lot of people. Folks, that's the wrong frame of reference to compare ourselves to each other. You know, the Bible never tells you when you're thinking about your sinful condition to compare yourself to others. It never says, now, you just check yourself out, see if you're better or worse than most people around you, and that'll tell you who you are. No, it never says that. Let's be more blunt. When you go to the doctor, and the doctor says you're sick, would you ever say to him, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, listen, doc, I'm not nearly as sick as a lot of people. You wouldn't say that, would you? What's that got to do with it? You're sick. You're still sick. It doesn't matter how many other people are sick. You're still sick. You wouldn't say to him, well, I don't feel sick. I don't feel bad at all. You wouldn't say that. The frame of reference is not how you feel. It's about what is true. What is the standard? You can be sick and not feel like you're sick. We know that. Here's how you determine how terrible your condition is before you were, or was before you were saved. The Bible is our frame of reference. The Bible tells us what we were like. The Bible is where you go. That's the objective standard. In the Bible, God talks about the pre-conversion, the before-conversion state. Of all those who have been saved, he talks about what we were before we were saved. Right here in Ephesians chapter 2. Go back there with me. Here's the second question now. What does the Bible say about our pre-conversion state? It has many things to say about it, but here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says one thing about it, one thing. He's describing it in one way. Now hold on to something, here it comes. This is blunt language, this is plain language. Look what Paul says in verse 1. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what the Bible says about us before we were saved. We were dead. He's writing to Christians in Ephesus. He's reminding them of their pre-conversion state, what they were like before God saved them. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. This was your pre-conversion state. As far as spiritual things were concerned, you were out there in the graveyard. You're dead. That's where you were. Dead in your trespasses and your sins. We're talking about spiritual deadness here, folks. It's, you know this, it's possibly physically, possible to be physically alive and spiritually dead. You know this. Our land is literally filled with people who are physically alive and spiritually dead. Physical life means you have appetite for things. You have an appetite for food. You engage in activities of various kinds. You feel various sensations. 
The Bible is telling us that person who is spiritually dead has no appetite. You've noticed this, haven't you, about cemeteries? There's nobody out there in the cemetery who's hungry today. Why? Because they're dead. They're dead. There's no activity out there. Have you ever walked by a cemetery and said, oh, look at that. All the corpses are having a picnic. You don't see that out there. They don't play volleyball. They don't have, they don't have a party out there. Why? Because they're dead. They're dead. I want you to know that while you cannot secure salvation by your works, if you have been saved, there will be some kind of activity. And if there's no activity, what does that say about you? Physical life means you have or you feel various physical sensations. If someone came up and slapped me on the back, I'd feel that because I'm alive physically. But those who are spiritually dead not only have no appetite for God, the things of God, they don't do anything for God. They don't feel anything for God either. They really don't. You don't walk through the cemetery and hear somebody say, ouch, now, do you? You know what I'm saying? You don't hear that coming up from the ground and say, some dead person must be feeling some sensation. And I'll just close the loop on this. If I'm walking through the cemetery and there's nobody alive out there and I hear somebody say, ouch, I'm going to be getting out of that cemetery real fast. How about you? I'm going to be getting out of there. Okay. Something that troubles me very greatly is how people who can profess to be alive spiritually never feel anything. Never. They're never moved. Nothing touches them. They don't feel any pain about sin at all. Their preacher can thunder from the pulpit about their sins, and they just sit there over and over again. You can talk about the love of God and how marvelous it is, and they don't feel anything. They have no sensation at all. They don't feel a thing. They're not moved. Why? Because they're dead. Dead people don't feel anything. They're dead. They're not moved. They're dead. Dead people don't feel anything. This is what it means to be spiritually dead. And that's what Paul is saying there in verse 1. It means that we are toward God the way dead people are in the physical sense. Are toward life. No appetite, no activity, no sensation. I want you to see what a terrible thing this is to be dead. This deadness is total. He says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Folks, deadness is deadness. It is crazy, it is stupid and ridiculous to stand before a dead human body and say, well, he's dead, but he, he's got more life than some other person. That makes no sense. But this is what people are doing today. Here they are sinners, and they say, well, I may be a sinner, but I'm not as sinful as so-and-so over there. That makes no sense at all because you're still dead toward God. It doesn't make any sense at all to say, well, I'm a sinner. All right, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as sinful as this guy or that guy. Well, I haven't uh, sold any drugs or shot anybody. I'm not that bad. That's like standing before a corpse and saying, well, this person who died today is as dead as this person who died a 100 years ago. Yes, folks, there are differences of degrees of decay. Yes, there are. But there are no degrees of deadness. If you're dead, you're dead. There's no degrees. The person who's been dead a 100 years is more decayed than the person who just died today. Yes, but he's just as dead. Just as dead. There are degrees of decay, but there are no degrees in deadness. None. It doesn't matter if you're a moral sinner or a respectable sinner, or how about this, I'm a nice sinner. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm nice about it. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I keep my sins to myself. I don't share them with others. Oh, really? The Bible says you're just as dead as a person who's a total reprobate, a total degenerate. You're just as dead. No degrees in deadness. You might not be as decayed as your fellow dead person, but you're just as dead. 
This is a radical condition the Apostle Paul's talking about here. The important thing about this is for you to see, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is where we all were before we were saved. We were dead. We were dead. Paul emphasizes this. Look again at verse 1. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. He says in verse 3 down there, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature, look at this last phrase, children of wrath just as the others. We were all in the same boat. When Paul says just as the others in verse 3, he said we were all once this way. We all were. We were all dead just like everybody else was dead in their sins. We are dead because of our sins. Our sins have made us dead toward God. You want to know why lost people don't care about the church? Because they're spiritually dead. That's why. They're dead to the things of God. They don't care about the things of God. We are sinners by nature. If we have a human nature, you're dead toward God because your human nature is sinful. You know this. We never have to teach our little boys and girls how to lose their temper and how to cheat and steal and hurt one another. That comes to them naturally, we say. If you've got a human nature, you've got a sinful human nature. You come into this world with a sinful human nature, and that sinful human nature means you're dead toward God. No interest in God, no appetite, no feeling, no activity, no sensation. Sin has made you this way, dead. We cannot stand here today and say, well, some are dead, some are not. The Bible says we're all dead. And the book of Romans says we all fall short of the glory of God. And this is where you were as a child of God. If you're a child of God, you were dead. But thank God Paul's able to say something else. Look at verse 4. Some great words here. But God. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. That's the good stuff, isn't it? That's the good part. We're made alive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you profess to be saved today, my friend, and you're having a struggle living for Christ and doing things God wants you to do, you need to go back and think about what you once were. You were dead in your sins, but God made you alive. God made you alive. And when you think about where you were, make sure you think accurately about what you were. You were dead. You were in a terrible Hopeless condition. But now God has saved you. Now you're saved. You're not dead anymore. There's been a resurrection. You've been saved. Now you just think about all of that for a moment. And are you then going to tell me that you don't feel like serving Christ? Well, I know he brought me from death to life. I know from darkness to light. But I just don't feel like it. Are you really going to say that? After I tell you that you were dead and Christ raised you up. I believe I feel like serving Him today. What do you feel like? I feel like serving Him. How about you? The heartfelt answer of every true Christian is, absolutely, yes, I want to serve Him because He made me alive. He saved me from my own spiritual death. Amen? Let's bow together and pray together. Our Father and our God, we bow before you today and we thank you for this reminder of what we were before you saved us. That we were spiritually dead. No appetite for you, for the things of you, for your church, for your people, for your word. No sensation, no activity, just dead. And sadly, most people down here today are dead spiritually. They don't know that. They think they're alive, but they're dead. Because unless you save them, there is no way for their deadness to go away. You're the only one that can bring us back to life. You're the only one. And so, Father, today as we've been reminding ourselves of what we once were 
before you saved us. May this so sink into us, so settle down deep into us. May we realize how much we should serve you, how much we should love you, how much we should give ourselves to you, no matter what. And if there is someone here today who's never been saved, they know right now these words are true for them. They're dead. They're spiritually dead. But they've never trusted you, never put all their hope, confidence, and faith in you and you alone, Jesus. Even now, God, would you speak to their heart, draw them to yourself. And may what we do here today in these moments now as we sing together, bring glory to you by giving ourselves to you as we pray for all of these things to be done for your glory, for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen.